Hi, I'm Femi OK. Today on the stream, Taiwan from the inside looking out. What does the future hold for its people? China has been very open about wanting to take over Taiwan, while its allies continue to show their support but tiptoe around recognizing Taiwan as a country. Have questions? Of course you do. Join the discussion live on YouTube to talk to our panel of Taiwanese guests. So let's start with a look at how the contentious relationship between Taiwan and China began. After the Chinese nationalists lost China's civil war in 1949, the nationalist KMT party fled to Taiwan, where they imposed martial law for 38 years. Martial law was lifted in 1987, and then the island's first direct democratic presidential elections were held in 1996. In 2016, Taiwan elected its first female president, Tsai Ing-wen. So joining us to talk about what's next for Taiwan, Brian Hugh, Freddie Lim and Wei Ting Yen. It's so good to have you. Thank you for joining us. Brian, please tell our audience what you do. Hi, my name is Brian Hugh. I'm a journalist and I'm one of the founding editors of New Blue Magazine, which covers social issues in Taiwan and politics. We were founded in 2014 after the Sunflower Movement. So good to have you. Freddie, what do people know you as and for doing? Hi, I'm Freddie Lim, a member of Taiwanese parliament and also a heavy metal singer. Nice to have you. And Wei Ting, so lovely to have you. Thank you for joining us. Please tell our audience what you're known for, what you do. Hello, everyone. My name is Wei Ting Yan. Uh, I'm currently an assistant professor at the government department at Franklin and Marshall College in Pennsylvania, United States, and I study Asian politics. Good to have you. I am wondering, guess, when a well-known personality or a, a leader of a country visits Taiwan, how much trouble does that cause, Brian? So China's reaction this time was quite strong. Uh, there have been diplomatic visits in the past by other leaders, uh, government officials, etc. But this time, China really used this as a pretext to escalate. Part of it's due to Pelosi being uh, so highly ranked that she is in line for succession to the presidency after the vice president. But I think in this case, China was looking for some way to ramp up tensions and took advantage of this visit. So, uh, waiting, you were in Taiwan when Nancy Pelosi, the U.S. Speaker of the House, visited Taiwan, there was so much lead up to that. But from the inside, what was the experience like? I have to say it, it was like you live in a parallel world. Like, so I think the week leading up to Pelosi's <laughs> visit, I think the policy circle in the uh, in DC was all fighting over whether it's a fourth uh, Taiwan Strait crisis. Whereas in Taiwan, I think people uh, having been living under the threat, uh, threat of China, live kind of as is uh, and live their life very normal. And I so I was very surprised to learn how much tension it has yeah. triggered between the U.S. and China over the Pelosi visit. All right, so level of tension outside of the country on a scale of 1 to 10 was what would you say waiting for Nancy Pelosi's visit? What would you say? Was it a, a 10 outside on my of Taiwan? Twitter, on my Twitter verse, yeah. I would say 8, <laughs> eight to 10. All right. But so, in Taiwan, it was probably... One. No way. That is extraordinary. All right, Freddie, you've got to come in here. I'm yeah. looking at your Twitter feed. People love to come visit you, not just Taiwan, but also come visit you. So this is Representative Jennifer Wexton. She popped in to see you in June. And then we have yeah. Ennis Freedom. Huge thanks to Ambassador of Taiwan and members of the Taiwanese Parliament for having me. We had some delicious Taiwanese food, etc., etc. So you are no stranger to hosting guests to Taiwan. What does right, that mean? Is it performative? Is it symbolic? How does it help? I think uh, because I think Taiwanese people can feel that it's no matter it's in terms of epi uh, epidemic prevention or regional security or the value of democracy and human rights. Uh, I think people in Taiwan feels that we play a very important role or more and more important role in the in this region, in this uh, Indo-Pacific region. So therefore, uh, exchanges between uh, democratic countries or activists or the democratic polit politicians and Taiwan should be normal and positive, should be encouraged. So because there is no way that we play a more and more important role, but uh, 
But if the people outside of Taiwan want to get engaged with Taiwan, need to be approved by China. That's it makes no sense, and it's it's not right. So I think Nancy Pelosi, she got a huge welcome in Taiwan because at, for Taiwanese, we we want to contribute con contribute more. We want to play more important role in this region. We can take this responsibility, but also the world mm -hmm. need to support us because when we play more important role, we got. Uh, uh, even heavier threats from China. So yeah. we need to stick together in this democratic uh, world. Waiting, I see you nodding, and Brian, I see you nodding as well. So you welcome visitors, but there, there's an impact. So I'm just looking here on Twitter, the Ministry of Defense, ROC, just keeping track of the number of incursions in Taiwan's territory from China. And these go on sporadically from day to day to day. Are visits worth these incursions from China? Waiting. Uh, so I agree with what Brian Freddie said. Uh, so since the passage of Taiwan Travel Act, like in 2018, we have seen, you know, several, many uh, delegations coming to visit Taiwan. And as Freddie mentioned, we as Taiwanese, we welcome to make friends with all other nations and engage with each other, you know, through more co cooperation and collaboration. And so I think Brian's correct in pointing out that I think China used this as an excuse, as a pretext to try to uh, change the status quo uh, by, uh, you know, uh, starting or uh, engaging with more uh, military drills. Yeah. And that is... And I don't think Taiwanese people will be deterred by this because we cannot just not making friends because the bully said you shouldn't make friends and we don't make friends. That does that doesn't work. Yeah, well, I agree totally. I think, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah. You go, Brian. You go first. Freddie, you go second. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, for example, just the fact that there's all this fear about the drills reflects there's a large gap between perceptions in Taiwan and outside of it. I mean, people in Taiwan would be first in line of fire. But on the converse to what much of the reaction in the international world was, people welcomed in Taiwan. I mean, there was support. People gathered at the airport to welcome Pelosi at the hotel that she was staying and so forth. And as you know, the world was going on about how this is pyromania, how this would lead to military threats. Who is it actually that's in the face of these threats? It's Taiwanese people, but somehow their perspectives were left out of the conversation. A conversation was had about the risks, but who are at risk is actually the Taiwanese people. And I think that the, the reactions of the visit are very different than between the Taiwanese people and what much international discourse was about it. Yes, a, a, a phrase I, yeah. I often hear, sorry, Fred, you go first. Go, go first, go first before I, I interject. Yeah, I, go I think that uh, uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi, uh, some, uh, I saw that some international media or some people uh, said that Nancy Pelosi brought the Chinese military exercises or the uh, uh, Taiwanese, we brought, we, we brought us to the uh, uh, this crisis or these uh, 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 these uh, uh, threats from China. We brought us to face these kind of threats. But I want to uh, emphasize that actually, actually, we have been facing this for decades. China has been keeping doing this uh, always like that. Not just because of Nancy Pelosi's visiting or because of what we have been doing. Uh, so we have to. Uh, people have to understand that we have been facing this for decades. China always want to find excuses to to uh, to bring higher threats on this region, not just uh, not just threatening threatening Taiwan, but also all the countries in this region. That's uh, that's the, the like the normal life we are dealing here in this region. You know, guess a phrase I often hear from within Taiwan is status quo preserving the status quo. Waiting, can you explain to our audience what status quo for Taiwan means? So uh, I think we can discuss, discuss this question from two perspectives. One is, you know, uh, uh, on the Taiwanese identity, and the second one is uh, Taiwan's relation with China. So on Taiwan's identity, I think the majority of Taiwanese people now identify themselves as, uh, you know, Taiwanese. Uh, but when it comes to deciding what the relationship with China should be, here there are some uh, debates going on in Taiwan. Some people think that Taiwan is already a de facto sovereignty country, whereas others, there are other people in Taiwan, think that we should uh, also uh, pursue de jure independence. 
But despite that differences, I think the majority of Taiwanese people uh, are pragmatic and do accept the status quo, which is that Taiwan is a de facto sovereignty state. Uh, and that's kind of what the status quo is. Mm -hmm. However, the tricky part is that the status quo itself is changing as well. And how long it can <sighs> yeah. remain and yeah. how it changes actually depends on China's level of aggression on the island in the future. Mm. Basically, the more aggression China imposed on Taiwan, uh, the status quo changed more toward independence. Let me just bring in just a, a quick thought oh. here from President um, Tsai Wen, because she mentioned status quo. So I'm going to play that. And then, Brian, can you just pick up from the thought that she's playing out here? Let's have a listen. This is from earlier this month. We are in close cooperation with international allies to monitor the military situation. At the same time, we're doing everything we can to let the world know that Taiwan is determined to safeguard stability and the status quo across the Taiwan Strait. President Tsai Ing-wen using that phrase status quo again, Brian. Yeah, absolutely. And I think particularly Tsai is very emphatic on this point, that she's not the one that's seeking to change the state of cross-strait relations. Tsai is particularly uh, intent on avoiding being labeled as provocateur in the relation with China. And China, in the meantime, tries to frame Taiwan as a troublemaker. But this is a form of victim blaming. The threats are, after all, coming from China. But I think particularly what also one sees with some of the, uh, for example, differences between discourse in Taiwan and outside of it that I alluded to earlier is this victim blaming, this view of Taiwan as having brought this on itself, uh, risking the region in order to maintain itself. And one does also see this argument that one sees circulated now in the international discourse that Taiwan should just give up its freedoms and this is the way to preserve peace. And unfortunately, I don't think that's the case, but uh, this gets brought up with regards to Pelosi visit and how it's discussed in this very hyperbolic tone as though it's the end of the world that we're on the verge of war. But as, as I kind of mentioned, we're, we're in Taiwan, people seem relatively chill about it and, and that's how things were. Let me bring in a new voice. Yeah. This is a voice of Fung Yi Chen. Freddie, I'm going to play this for you because what Fung Yi Chen told us earlier was about appreciating allies, but the allies need to step up. They can't just be allies from a distance because if the status quo is changing and you need your allies to call on, what might happen? This is what he told us earlier. The political and economic systems in Taiwan are very different from China. It is a consensus in Taiwan that people want to preserve the ways of life, democracy, freedom, and the advanced economy. However, China's annexation is looming because it is a sacred mission for them to unify Taiwan. Therefore, Taiwan's government is trying to strengthen the self-defense capability. For the US, it is very important because research shows that the high-level visit reassure people from partner countries. It is also very important for the U.S. and allies to provide more economic and military resources to deter China from changing the status quo. So, Freddie, I'm a little bit yeah. cynical about these visitors coming to Taiwan who are calling themselves their, your allies. But if China does more than just fly over the Taiwanese Strait, what will your allies be doing? I think first of all, I think uh, for now, I think the allies should uh, show the attitude that they are they are very supportive of Taiwan. They uh, stick with us. I think that's very important, especially after the uh, Russia invasion to Ukraine, that uh, uh, we can't uh, sh uh, send the wrong message to China. We need to let China know that if anything happened here, the allies will uh, will stand with Taiwan. That's we, uh, since the international community has remained uh, stat, uh, strategic ambiguity uh, for the situation in this region, and that might send the wrong message to China. So it's very important to give China a more clear uh, image, more clear message that the allies are stand with Taiwan. And by sending the high-ranking uh, officials to Taiwan to get engaged with Taiwan uh, on the table to lay our friendship on the table to show Taiwan to show to China that to know that uh, there are friends of Taiwan everywhere and friends stick with Taiwan. That's very important. And I do believe that after the uh, Russian in uh, after the Russia uh, invasion to Ukraine, uh, Taiwanese people know that if we stand. Uh, for a longer time, if we can fight, us, if we can protect our land 
uh, as, as much as we can if, uh, during uh, China invade Taiwan, then I think the allies and our friends will, will support us more, will stick to, uh, with us. I think that's a very strong uh, message for us. I am wondering what it feels like, Brian, to live in a nation where huge powers on one side of the Atlantic and then huge, a huge power as your neighbour talk about Taiwan as if it's a pawn in a game of chess. What does that feel like? Yeah, that is something that I find very concerning because that was also, I think, in regards to the Pelosi visit, how much of it was discussed. Again, as I mentioned, there was not the focus on what Taiwanese thought about their own future. There was a lot of talk about it in terms of the U.S. and China and so forth. And so I think that does raise one of the questions. I mean, the visit was welcomed in Taiwan, and I think many in the international world did not get that because of the fact that this is seen as a show of support. And Taiwan is really wanting support from the international community right now. Uh, but then the rest of the world is afraid, thinks it's advisable. And there are some questions, I think, to be raised about or the substantive gains from this, symbolic or mostly just for show, or if there's actually thing Taiwan gains from this kind of visit, though it puts Taiwan line of fire. Uh, but in that respect, I think that this is long term in the fate of Taiwan. And I, I would hope to see that change about the way Taiwan is discussed. That's more attention to the way Taiwanese want their future to be. Um, I mean, oftentimes then you just have this notion that Taiwanese should give up their freedoms to preserve peace or that uh, they should stop being, making noises about the self-determination and that kind of thing, and that China will go away. But I think also what's important to notice is that China's live fire drills also, uh, for example, targeted Japan, that there is missiles that ended up in Japan's exclusive economic zone. Uh, there's also Chinese naval activity directed at South Korea, for example, in the Yellow Sea and the Bohai Sea. And so I think this points to China's uh, rather expansive aims, its aggression towards not just Taiwan, that if Taiwan is ceded over in some form, it wouldn't just be Taiwan. I mean, ta China would still continue to be aggressive in the area. And I think that's, that's very key to keep in mind. I'm just looking here on my laptop, and it's a, a piece that you wrote, Brian, for The Guardian. It says, don't believe China's convenient historical tales. Taiwan belongs to the Taiwanese. Earlier this month, on the Al Jazeera show, The Bottom Line, the US ambassador to China had this to say about the history of China and Taiwan and the relationship between Taiwan and China. Have a listen to this. The question of Taiwan, fundamentally speaking, is not about uh, democracy or freedom. It's about China's national sovereignty and the territorial integrity. It's about uh, the national dignity of Chinese people. The historical fact is that China has been part uh, Taiwan has been part of China since ancient times. People need to understand history and need to know the uh, international law. Brian, how do you argue with a country that says it's a historical fact that your nation is part of our nation? <laughs> Well, I think it's an invented history because the fact is the PRC has never controlled Taiwan. And China often claims these uh, claims about ancient history, but I don't know why we're then invalidating the current claims of the Taiwanese people to self-determination based on ancient history. The PRC has never controlled Taiwan. Uh, it is one of the forces that overthrew Imperial China. And then it's founding these claims to Taiwan on the basis of Imperial Chinese history. But if you look at it, Taiwan only became a province in 1887, and then a mere eight years later, it was ceded to the Japanese. And so that's already the last imperial dynasty. It's not the case that Taiwan was part of China since time immemorial. But then China will deploy these nationalist abstractions about uh, long-term or ancient history to claim then that Taiwan is just as always in part of China. And I think that first, A, these claims shouldn't matter in the face of what contemporary Taiwanese people think what their future should be. Do they identify as Chinese or not? And I think the answer is probably not. Uh, but then also, I mean, this history is also just not incorrect. It's just incorrect. It's not true. And China continues to trot out this claim, though, just in terms of its conversations with other places in the world. Freddie? Yeah, I think, uh, I think, Although the, the history that uh, the ambassador, the Chinese ambassador, uh, understands, I don't, I, I don't think it's right. But uh, it's very important that that's the reason why the people in this region, not just in Taiwan, but in this region, feel uh, China is so dangerous, is a bad neighbor. Because with that kind of ideology, China can also claim that Korea is a part of China. 
Mongolia is a part of China, Vietnam is a part of China, all these regions that have been invaded by China in, the, in their thousands of history are still their uh, legal territories. In that kind of ideologies, they are so dangerous in this region. That's, that's the reason why uh, we always uh, emphasize that, we always tell the world that if we lose Taiwan, then there will be next. Taiwan will not be the last one to, to be sacrificed, to, to, to lose, but there will always be the uh, next one because with that kind of Chinese ideology, they play a very in, uh, dangerous role in this region and always a threat to the neighbors. Can I yeah, jump absolutely. in here? Yeah, wait, to go ahead. Add mm -hmm. more. So the beginning, the, the Chinese embedders say it's not about democracy and non-democracy. I think it absolutely <laughs> has a lot to do with preserving democracy. Uh, I know it sounds like just a value thing that uh, has only have symbolic meaning, but as a matter of fact, China is right now one of the largest authoritarian countries in the world. And in the past decade, they have been trying to export their authoritarianism through their uh, Build and Roll initiative. And with the rise of populism and the erosion of democracy everywhere in the world, I think preserving democracy and what it, it's preserving Taiwan, preserving democracy is especially important because it sent a very strong signal, not only for Taiwanese people, but also for basically people living in democracy around the around the globe. Okay. And as a matter of fact, Taiwan is the only Chinese-speaking democracy right now in the world. I think if the ambassador thinks that's not the point or that's not the matter, I think it's because he doesn't believe democracy is functional, is workable Waiting. in the Chinese-speaking world. Waiting. We, we, we have a split in our YouTube audience who are watching right now. So, Diami Brooks says, Taiwan, first of all, is not a country. That is a fact. So, uh, Brian and Waiting and Freddie, you, you push back on that. Uh, Marie says, Taiwan has a right to be free. They were annexed during the Qing Dyna Qing Dynasty. The, excuse me, the Qing dynasty, um, <laughs> but was never colonized like Japan. There is a debate that goes back and forth. I am wondering, just from the psyche of people who live in Taiwan, um, waiting, you did a, a wonderful example of that when I said the level of anxiety outside of Taiwan was eight, but inside of Taiwan was one. What about the level of threat that you feel from your neighbor where is that on that scale of one to 10? The idea that China is saying, actually, Taiwan belongs to us. At some point, we want to take it. What's the level of anxiety there? Uh, so I think Taiwan, no matter how people call, whether Taiwan is a country or not, it is a, it is a, it's a society that democratically elect its uh, top decision maker for the past more than 20 years. And it has a democratic government. Uh, people have all the democratic rights. So regardless of how other people call Taiwan, uh, it is a, a functioning uh, sovereignty state. And so on that level, I don't think, um, I don't think the anxiety level is that high for people give us, in Taiwan. Give us a, give us a number, because it's always illuminating on a number a scale of one to 10. Anxiety I mean, the, that China will actually one day take Taiwan. Does one to oh, ten? Oh, the anxiety level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, me personally is growing. <laughs> okay. From probably five to seven. Five to seven. But oh wait, let me I'm just check. Sure. Let me just check with Freddie because we're in the last thirty seconds of the show. Your anxiety level that China will one day take Taiwan. What's your anxiety level, Freddie? One to ten. Yeah, I think about seven. Okay, and Brian? About seven. Uh, I think about the same. I'm actually pretty chill about though. It's not immediate as a threat. They're trying right. to make it that seem that way. All right. So fascinating. I, I love that you helped us understand Taiwan from the inside looking out. So outside there's hyperbole. Inside there's relatively calm. Five to seven. I'm out of calm. All right, thank you so much for being with us, Brian and Freddie and waiting, and for your comments and questions you're debating on YouTube. Appreciate that. I will see you next time on the stream. Thanks for watching. Take care.
blinding. I see I worked out the re reason I couldn't see what 